Hi, I'm Ashley James with Good Morning Maryland. Welcome into our Facebook Live today. We are so excited to have Dr. Joseph DiRocco, Director of the GI Oncology Program at GBMC, and his patient, Sam Perino. Did I get it right? You did. All yeah. right. Well, we want to start today just talking generally about the GI Oncology Program at GBMC. When we say GI Oncology, what are, what are we talking about here? Right. So the GI refers to gastrointestinal. So um, gastrointestinal means, you know, anything involving from the esophagus down to the anus. And uh, there are, and oncology refers to cancer conditions. And so the GI oncology program was created at GBMC to add additional focus at the hospital to treat intestinal uh, cancers. And so, you know, there's been cancer surgery on the GI tract at GBMC for as long as it existed, but now there's an additional emphasis or focus on building up the program and to improve quality and to improve patient experiences. Okay, Sam, I want to jump to you. So tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, yeah, about four months ago I was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer. And so after getting over the initial shock of that, uh, we visited some surgeons and found out what our options were. Dr. DiRocco was uh, excellent at explaining to me what uh, was involved, <clears throat> what the potential prognosis would be. I was very fortunate because mine was very curable. Um, and uh, so then once I knew what the problem was, it was how do I deal with it. And again, he and his staff were very helpful in uh, getting me the information I needed to have an optimal experience. Yeah, and, and you first started going to Dr. Duraco when? Um, late October. Late October. Yeah. And you will be seeing him? Uh, well, this year for every three months, and after that we'll see. So what is your prognosis now? Cured. Cured. So yes. No evidence of disease, I guess, is the technical term. That's correct. Wow. Yeah, that is great news, and that's the news you want to see in all your patients. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we want to start this conversation on Facebook. We want you to tune in, ask any question to Dr. Joseph Duraco, and uh, he's here to answer. So let's let's use him. So we had some questions that were submitted earlier. Um, okay, Sharon wrote in saying that she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease 38 years ago. Mm -hmm. I know my chances of developing colon cancer rises each year. My question is, should I have a colonoscopy every year to detect any signs of the onset of cancer? Yeah, so um, the risk of developing cancer after the initial diagnosis of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis um, starts increasing above the average risk by about 10 years after the initial uh, time of diagnosis. So if you've had Crohn's or colitis for at least 10 years, uh, recommendation, and again, there's, you know, there's differences on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, but in general, I recommend doing a colonoscopy every one to two years um, once you reach that decade of chronic inflammation of the colon. And did you, were you having routine colonoscopies? Is that what yes, you found you are? Yes, ex exactly. Um, I had had one, my first one when I was 40, nothing was there. Ten years later I had my second one and they found several, all benign, and so I was put on a three month, or a three year regimen, and then at that point they found the uh, cancerous uh, polyp. So nobody likes to talk about a colonoscopy. Nobody wants to go in for it. They're usually I like terrified. To talk about you, it. Lo you love to talk <laughs> about it. What can you tell people? Are they as bad as people think they are in their heads? No. For me, they have not been anything like people are concerned about. The I would say the most difficult part, and it's not really difficult, is preparing for it uh, the day before. But for the colonoscopy, you go in, you're sedated. And uh, they do the colonoscopy, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up, and uh, the That's doctor comes in and tells me what happened. So you talked about the prep. We had a question that came in about the prep. Um, is there anything other than people can do besides drink the nasty drink? Yeah, so I mean, there are a variety of different preparations. And so the idea of doing the preparation is, you know, take laxatives typically by mouth, um, you know, because during the colonoscopy, in order to be able to see things inside the colon, have to empty out all the stools. So the traditional way is to take, you know, an oral laxative, you know, historically it was a gallon of go lightly, 
um, you know, uh, nothing to do with Holly Go Lightly. But um, and then over time, you know, as industry and people complain about it, the you know the amount of volume that's necessary for the prep has reduced. There's different flavors. There's you can do a Miralax and Dulcolax prep where there's no flavor to the you know to the drink. And then finally, you know, there's um, a relatively new thing which is not done you know very widely, but we offer is something called colon hydrotherapy. Um, so you might have heard of people getting colonics for you know health or a variety of different reasons, um, and so you can actually do that as a preparation for the colonoscopy, so you don't have to drink anything. I have actually heard a little bit more about colonics recently. Uh, that's almost somewhat trendy, I guess. Have you heard about this? What do you recommend to people who are doing it for just... I don't have a recommendation don't. on that basis. There are a number of patients who have chronic constipation, and there's definitely a role for doing um, colonics in that situation just to be able to empty out the colon and to basically do a retraining process. But, you know, there's not a lot of good evidence to suggest that doing colonics, you know, has any unique health benefits. And so... Uh, we had another question come in on Facebook. What are the symptoms of colorectal cancer? So, um, so the main thing is, you know, there are really are no early signs or symptoms of colorectal cancer. And that's why we recommend doing screening with colonoscopy, because by the time that the uh, patient develops symptoms, you know, it's typically because the lesion or the cancer is more advanced. And so, you know, in his testament, you know, he pursued the regular screening colonoscopies according to the guidelines and, you know, unfortunately developed a cancer, but it was still very early, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, you know, the typical signs for colon cancer or rectal cancer are, you know, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, uh, change in your bowel habits. So if you're, you know, you have a new onset of constipation or diarrhea, um, you know, unexplained weight loss, lack of appetite, bloating. There's a variety of different, you know, sort of generalized symptoms that, you know, um, should prompt somebody to get investigated. Sam, did you have any symptoms no, beforehand? Not, no, none at all. No. And did it run in your family? <laughs> no, I was the first. You were the first. Does it run in families? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are a few known genetic conditions where it puts people at a higher risk for developing cancer, and those can be tested by, you know, um, by doing a genetic testing if there is a suspicion for it. Um, apart from those, there is a hereditary basis to it, and so people with a family history, you know, with first-degree relatives, with either advanced polyps or cancers, should get screened more often and earlier. Okay, um, somebody wrote in about the benefits of cannabis related to cancer treatments. From a doctor's perspective, do you recommend it? <clears throat> so, you know, as far as I know, um, Cannabis is not a known treatment for cancer. I mean, I don't think there is, you know, there may be studies ongoing, there may be anecdotes where people say, well, you know, I had this cancer and then I used cannabis and the cancer disappeared. But I mean, as, at least as far as we, you know, have some degree of certitude, you know, I don't think that there is any proven benefit in terms of the treatment of cancer uh, with the use of cannabis. Having said that, um, you know, there are side effects, um, you know, symptoms related to. Um, the cancer itself or the treatment thereof, like in terms of chemotherapy, et cetera, that, you know, cannabis has a potential to help with. I'm not a medical oncologist, I'm a surgeon, so there's really, for me personally, there's not a real role for using cannabis in my practice. Um, but, you know, it's now apparently legal in Maryland. Um, doctors can't write a prescription for it because it's still federally illegal. Um, but, you know, you can make recommendations, and I think there's mechanisms to... Um, you know, to get patients who would benefit from it, um, you know, to get them cannabis. But uh, again, personally, in my practice, I don't really have any role for using it. Gotcha. We had another question come in. Are there any other tests that can detect colon cancer other than the colonoscopy? Yeah, so, I mean, the one that's been around for the longest time is, um, you know, checking the uh, uh, stool cards um, for signs of occult blood. And that can be done on an annual basis. There's you know, newer things is something called the Cologuard test. There are, you know, um, research going on to look for um, tumor cells circulating in the bloodstream that, you know, as they get better sensitivity with that, that might be a real promising way to investigate it. But, I mean, ultimately, the best test, you know, um, is a colonoscopy. It has the highest, you know, ability to detect polyps, you know, which can be removed during the colonoscopy, thereby preventing that polyp from turning into cancer. 
and you know has a much higher sensitivity in terms of finding cancers that are there. So you had surgery. I did. Correct, is your treatment, and how was the recovery after? Um, much better than I thought it was going to be, uh, in large part because of the enhanced recovery program that GBMC has, uh, where you prepare ahead of time. You're in the right frame of frame of mind. You're more relaxed than I thought I could be, just from uh, being prepared, knowing what to expect. Um, and actually, after the surgery, I took no additional pain medication except Tylenol for a few days. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, it's so great to hear you talk about it. You've had such a great ex experience, you know, as great as it can be, I guess, for right, right. what the diagnosis was. You know, taking us back to that time when you were diagnosed, I mean, what are you thinking? What's going through your head? Well, the first couple of days, it's like shock. Yeah. Uh, and you're thinking the worst, and you're thinking, okay, how do I prepare for my wife to be taken care of when I'm gone, and all these kinds of things. Um, but once you start to understand what's going on, and in my case, I would have to say it's easier than in most, uh, probably typical of colon cancer, though, that it's it's curable it's highly curable and i understood that and i understood what i needed to do so once i got to that point i was ready to deal with it and get it taken care of yeah that has to be some of you know maybe the hardest part of being a doctor having to give that news to a patient yeah so i mean i typically end up being the one to do it and so um you know i think information and education you know taking away a lot of the as much of the mystery of the diagnosis as possible is really important for patients you know so it's not just you know giving people bad news but saying like well there's this but we have a plan you know and the plan is this and this is what we're you know this is what you can expect and you know and when people try to focus on well what if you know I want to go down a dark road you know there's usually no reason to go there until the time is right you know, so try to keep things as, you know, informed and positive as possible. Yeah. We have a couple more questions coming in on Facebook. Okay, so what is your take on W and W approach with consolidation chemotherapy? Does that make sense? Because it doesn't yeah, make that's, sense to me who's not um, the doctor. <laughs> that's really like, um, you know, I, I think the W and W means watch and wait. Um, you know, that's my interpretation mm -hmm. of that question. So, um, Try to do this quickly. So, um, originally with anal cancer, uh, the treatment was surgery, and then um, they realized that they can treat with chemotherapy and radiation up front, and that the tumors would disappear a uh, vast majority of the time. And so they stopped operating on these people, and they found that actually just doing chemotherapy and radiation um, up front was sufficient treatment for people, and they just needed to be followed and you would reserve surgery for when you know either the tumor didn't respond or it came back so now there's a push to do the same thing with rectal cancer which is a different type of cancer but it's in the same general area and so you know for people with advanced rectal cancer we treat with chemotherapy and radiation up front followed by surgery and so this watch and wait uh, involves doing the chemotherapy and radiation and then if the tumor disappears which happens depending somewhere around 15% of the time, sometimes up to 25%, you know, to just follow that patient. And just, you know, with a series of x-ray tests and scopes and, you know, biopsies if necessary. And so there is a growing trend, but it's not something that's widely adopted, nor really should it be outside of clinical trials at this point. Okay. Um, another question, or maybe a comment on here, uh, Andrea is saying people are being diagnosed with colon cancer much younger then uh, age 50, do you think pesticides and GMOs in our foods are the problem? And we also had uh, another question that sort of ties into this. Is there a direct link getting colorectal cancer, certain foods or activities? So is, are doctors seeing a link here in anything connected to this type right. of cancer? Well, I mean, I don't know how a doctor would be able to identify a link. I mean, it's, it's really a question for, you know, um, epidemiologists and people in like the, you know, CDC. I know that there is, um, you know, a recent um, statement by the, um, the World Health Organiza Organization that stated that processed meats, you know, increase your risk of colon cancer. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's actually like a relatively small increase, and I don't think it's responsible for, you know, all the younger onset of diagnosis that we're seeing, you know, specifically in, you know, colorectal cancer. Does it affect men or women? 
more? So it's nearly equal. Um, you know, it tends to be a little more present in men than women, colorectal cancer, but the difference is relatively small. So it really affects men and women almost equally. So we don't have different guidelines or we don't treat men and women differently with this disease. Yeah. Um, as far as getting a, an appointment with Dr. Duraco and getting the number we just posted, we have a lot of people commenting that they, they want your number, they want your contact information. <laughs> okay. uh, and I think Sam would say, he's a great doctor, right? Definitely. <laughs> he highly recommends him. Um, what are your thoughts on probiotics? Um, so uh, there is a tremendous amount of research being done currently in what's called the microbiome. So we have, you know, billions of bacteria in our gut and what types of bacteria, how much of each, um, it clearly has some impact on a variety, not just in terms of our feeling of well-being, but also susceptibility to different diseases, etc. So um, when people take probiotics, the idea is to try to restore that microbiome to a, you know something that's a little more normal. Um, and, you know, the problem is we don't really know what normal is. So, you know, there are uh, some clear situations in which the use of probiotics is helpful. So when people take antibiotics um, to treat other infections, sometimes those antibiotics can cause uh, diarrhea. And part of the reason why it causes that is because it kills some of the bacteria in the gut. And so, you know, healthy bacteria die and some unhealthy bacteria can grow. And so the idea of probiotics in, in that situation is to try to restore, you know, normalcy. Um, you know, there are some people with chronic diarrhea that improve with probiotics. I've seen some people with constipation that improve with probi probiotics. You know, my thought is, I mean, there's very little risk in taking it. And so if you are having difficulty, you know, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty low risk, um, you know, trial at least to do and see if it, see if it helps. Okay. Uh, another question. In 2017, I had polyps in my colon. Everything I eat hurts my stomach, bloated, gassy, pain. It seems like it takes 12 to 20 hours for just one meal to digest, and the stomach pain keeps me from going places. What would uh, you recommend? So, well, I mean, I recommend she see a gastroenterologist. Um, you know, I'm a colorectal specialist, so I just deal with, you know, diseases from the lower intestinal tract. But, I mean, it sounds like, a, I mean, that certainly doesn't sound normal, and I think it warrants investigation. So she should, you know, either contact her primary care doctor or uh, get one of the gastroenterologists. Is that sort of the first step when you're having any type of pain like that? You know, you went over some of um, the signs or symptoms people might see with colorectal cancer. Would you go to your primary care first? I mean, what are the, these seem like very easy <coughs> steps, right? But yeah, I mean, so. I mean, your primary care physician should, you know, I mean, should always be available as the first step to try to find help navigating, you know, healthcare system. Because, I mean, a lot of people don't even know what a colorectal surgeon is, right. you know. So, um, you know, so a primary care, you know, would know and uh, can tell you, you know, what type of doctor you should see. Um, some people who are, you know, informed and they know what they want, I mean, they go directly to specialists and, you know, and that's fine. But, I mean, you know, you should always have your primary care doctor as a backup. Yeah, and Sam, you can talk about your experience. Did you go to your primary care is the one who said, time for your colonoscopy? Right, And right. it went from there, and then exactly. how did you end up with Dr. Duraco? I think the colonoscopist recommended him and uh, a couple of other doctors. So I went to see all of them, my wife and I did, mm -hmm. and um, we felt very comfortable with Dr. Duraco. So he did the surgery, and we're very happy that he did. What advice could you give for somebody uh, who gets the diagnosis that you had? Um, learn as much as you can about what you're going to be going through. Prepare yourself uh, mentally. Uh, I did a lot of meditation. Um, I increased my exercise uh, to make myself as strong as I possibly could before the surgery so that recovery would be easier. Um, and uh, find a good surgeon, someone who does a lot of these and is successful at it. In fact, one of, the, one of the surgeons that I talked to uh, from another hospital, when he heard that uh, Dr. Duraco was going to be my surgeon, he said, you're in great hands. Yeah, this is a little bit off topic, but I, I did a story recently on how people are now recording um, the time with their doctor, you know, on their phones, recording it, because you go into the doctor, and you probably would agree with this, you go into and you get so much information, and especially when it's something so serious, and then you walk out and you think, I have no idea what he just said. You know, because it's just so much information. What are, what are some tips for for people? Yeah. So um, 
I mean, the main thing that helps is bring somebody. Okay. You know, because uh, especially if you're struggling with the, you know, the stress and anxiety of having a new diagnosis, and you're, you know, I mean, your mind can be all over the place during, you know, during a, a meeting with the physician, and so having a second set of ears, that helps. You know, in the absence of having a second set of ears, I mean, I guess a phone would suffice. So far, nobody's asked to record our conversation. Um, actually, maybe there has, but I mean, you know, I mean, uh, my thought is whatever helps them, you know, digest things and, you know, and if it, uh, you know, if it keeps me from having to answer the same question multiple times, then, you know, even better. And is there a better link online for getting information? Because um, the internet can be a very scary place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even just to get, you know, if you have cold symptoms and you go on the internet, it's like, oh, you have something terrible. So is there a, you know, do you recommend one link? I don't know, Mayo Clinic or, yeah. or something like that? So, I mean, uh, you know, in the... I mean, the American Society of Colorectal Surgery has a, its own website with patient information. So, you know, in the absence of actually reviewing, you know, a lot of different sites, and I, I do use other uh, facilities, um, you know, online information for different things because some people do it better than others. So I can't give you, like, sort of a general thing, but, I mean, if you go to the, at least for colorectal cancer, the, you know, the American Society of Colorectal Surgery, and I think it's, like, www.fascrs.org. A couple more questions, and then we will wrap up. Okay, uh, I have acid reflux, and it can be so painful. What can I do besides taking my medication? Uh, you know, my answer is similar to the last one. Is you, should, <laughs> you know, if you're, you know, if you continue to have reflux despite medication, you really should be evaluated. And you know, the person to do that again is, you know, is best a, a gastroenterologist. And is it chronic pancreatitis? Does that sound correct? Uh, chronic what, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis. What can be done for a patient with? Chronic pancreatitis. You know, so again, it's not something I treat, but in, in general, um, you know, I mean, there are medications and, um, you know, nutritional enzymes that people can take to help digest. It sort of depends, you know, what kind of symptoms they're having. Um, you know, we have uh, Dr. Johnny at GBMC who does a lot of endoscopic ultrasounds and, you know, so diagnosing. I mean, the first thing is that not everybody with chronic pancreatitis is the same. So some people have it because there is an anatomic abnormality, and sometimes those things can be treated uh, along with other types of pancreatitis by surgery, um, you know, in the extreme, uh, you know, circumstances. So there, there is always some other treatment, but, you know, again, it should probably start with a gastroenterologist. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy. have to get back to, to patients. And Sam, thank you for joining us and sharing your story. Um, you know, it certainly helps so many people going through what you did. Right. So thank well, you. Thank and you, how can Ashley. people get in touch with you? Um, so uh, probably the easiest way is just to contact our office. Okay. Um, and, and we have uh, the number 410-296-1661. And you can see it on our Facebook Live. So thank you again. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next month on Facebook Live with GBMC. Have a great day.